hello, hello. <laughs> How is everyone doing? I did not think I was going to come into the studio uh, today, especially because these protests are very exhausting, honestly, and obviously triggering, and there's a lot of emotional labor that you know, goes into it. And so I never thought that I would be here in the studio, but I saw a lot of people reaching out that Dan Schneider uh, posted a video on Dan Warp. Which, by the way, Dan Warp is an interesting name because I really feel like he is warped. You know, his perception of things is warped in general. And so it's actually kind of fitting. Um, but once I saw that he, you know, created a video, I thought I, I, I would rather watch it with everyone. <laughs> because I feel like I'm, I don't know, I don't know what to expect, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about it. <laughs> so um, we're going we're gonna to do this together, but I'm not sure who in the chat watched the live protest, and I do want to just give a shout-out uh, first to everyone that physically showed up today. We live in a very virtual realm, right? And everything is shared virtually, which is very impactful. And it definitely serves its purpose when it's used properly. And I'm not trying to downplay um, virtual reality. But there is something about physically showing up, and which is why I choose to protest. Because when you physically show up, it really shows how much this means to you. Just like the letters that were defending Brian Peck, it, when someone's writing a letter, it really shows, you know, uh, where their priorities are, right? There's something about a letter, for example, that makes you feel a type of way. And so with protests, yeah, it's old school, but it's amazing because you're showing the world that it's worth it to you to physically show up. You're showing, <laughs> yeah, you're showing the world like, yeah, this means something to me. And this really means something to me. You know, I started this all, you know, years ago now, and it means something to me because the impact that these networks and record labels and all of this uh, changed my life forever. And all of these corporations love to remind everyone how many years ago it was. But for survivors, this is lifelong trauma. And there's no um, expiration date on it, so to speak. There's no, we don't think about the date. You know what I mean? The body keeps the score. And sadly, I mean, I can only speak for myself at random. I'll get flashbacks to, you know, bad things that happened to me. And that could be while I'm cleaning the dishes, you know, or I'm walking down my steps to go into my car, or a song comes on, or I see something on TV, or a friend says something. And I'm immediately put back into uh, what happened to me. And I think a lot of survivors can relate to that. You know, I really don't like when people try to say, you know, how long ago it was. Because lifelong trauma, ABUSE. And I don't like when people downplay it with years. And it goes to show you, you know, the ones who are usually telling you how many years ago it was <laughs> um, are the people that don't care. The people that don't understand, that don't want to care, that don't want to understand. And, you know, that's why it's power to survivors. Because it's time for us to tell the world how we feel and what our lives are like and how ABUSC has impacted our lives and affected us. It's time. Survivors have been silent for too long. 
and not only silent, but by Hollywood, for example, purposefully silenced with, you know, NDAs, which is, sorry, over here. These corporations silence survivors. And, sorry, what? I do, I do. Oh, sorry. One, supporting you since 2019. Power to survivors, power to you, power to Drake Bell. One, you're amazing. It's so nice to see you here. Thank you so much. But this is, I want to, I just want to say like, okay, this is Nickelodeon, right? This is Hollywood. For so many people, that's not necessarily relatable. My intention and my hopes is that every survivor out there, and this is not just SA, this is every type of survivor is being validated right now and heard and seen. And that we can come together and create change and change the world. And maybe it's naive of me, you know, to think these things, but I still believe it. I really do believe if all survivors unite, we don't have to be friends per se, right? But if we all unite in creating change and making sure that survivors are validated and that they are able to seek justice and get the justice that they personally wanna see, and each survivor is different, right? Each survivor has their own vision of justice. But I hope that we're getting to a point where we support the survivor, that we center the survivor. Justice is all about centering the person that was harmed. What do they want? How are they feeling? It's not about how we, what we think about them, how we view them, if we like them or if we don't like them. That's not what it's about. Survivors are human. They never deserved it. <laughs> Ever. And it's about community now stepping in and going, where do we draw the line? How can community be better bystanders? How can community be better allies? Because survivors don't have enough allies. They don't. And this is outside of Hollywood. You know, this is survivors, you know, everywhere when they come forward about what happened to them, it's scary, no matter who it is that they're talking about. And also everyone has to know what Dan Schneider is saying, he's embarrassed, right? As a survivor, you feel embarrassed by what happened to you. And to have someone else know, for example, is a big deal. And then when you see people that you love or friends of yours or, you know, whatever, that don't support you or don't believe you or don't want to help you, it's extremely re-traumatizing. And it's beyond hard on the survivor. And that's why I try to focus you know, e-predators, not just on the predators, right? I wanted to be focused on community because I really do believe that if community starts stepping in and they start drawing a line and they start empowering survivors and standing behind them, we can create change together. We can. And this is not about, oh, believe me, you know, believe us. This is about centering the person that says they were harmed. And what can we do to support that journey? Isn't that what it's all about, being human? Like, what else? Credentials, whatever. What is it to be human? And that's about caring about people. And wanting people to feel 
safe and seen and heard and validated and cherished and then people close to them loved. That's all that really matters at the end of the day. Really. And it's time for everyone to step into that. And especially with like capitalism and everything, like we're, we're, we're taught not to care about our neighbors or care about those closest to us, about our status and about our resume, you know, all these things. That, that's not who we really are. We're not just an employee, we're, we're people. And we have families and friends and thoughts and dreams and loving people and whatever. That's what matters. And any time we're forgetting our humanity um, is always a sad moment in time, I think. And we need to be constantly reminded of our humanity. And I hope that survivors can do that. Because I think everyone has survived something in their life. I think there are so many survivors out there. It's not just about essay. It's about surviving. And sadly, a lot of the realities of how the world functions now, you know, it, it, it is survival mode. Things are set up in a way that makes us feel like we're constantly in survival mode. And I'm hoping that everyone out there, just because you're not a survivor of SA, you could be a survivor of something else. I think survivor, there's survivors of breakups, there's survivors of this, that. We've all survived something in our life. We've all survived something in our life. And I hope that that connects us with one another. That we know what it means to survive. And we can acknowledge that in one another and we can support someone's survival. And so, wait, what is, what's the chat? Um, is it Nico? Um, from a survivor here in Australia who was in the entertainment industry, I'm so freaking proud of all of you for standing up. I know how hard this is to do firsthand, keep it up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This goes for all survivors. I just don't want this. Oh, there's new members too. Welcome new members. I'm sorry. I, I will get to everything once I'm, and it's um, Gabriel, Gabriel Greenboy. Welcome to the Munchies. Welcome, welcome. Angel, Angel, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome new members. Um, it's so nice to see everyone here. And just nice, like, thank you for everyone who tuned in to the protest. Um, it means a lot, and I hope it means a lot to survivors everywhere. I really, really do. I want survivors to see that people uh, will physically show up for them. Survivors united will never be divided. I wanted to see that, and so I created it. I get to create the thing and see it. And it's very healing for me personally. Sometimes it's only like five people, you know, or like even like just like five friends of mine. But there's something very nice about seeing like physically people show up for you and drive in traffic or whatever. <laughs> like sometimes like skip work or whatever it is, you know? Um, there's something very beautiful about that. And I feel like with virtual reality, you know, like just social media, you know, we, we lose sight of that of how amazing it is when we see people in person and we see people showing up for us physically. And so that's why I created it, because I wanted to see it. I wanted to see if it was possible, and I realized it was. And now I get to share it with everybody. And that's really nice. I think the best part about it is sharing it. I hope that survivors see that people care about them. And that's all I can honestly wish for in this lifetime. So, you know, here I am, I'm back in the studio. There's um, this blimp behind me of Sickelodeon. How, how is everyone um, feeling? How is everyone feeling? Okay, so we're gonna go into 
Um, yeah, I can see it closer here. Um, I'm bringing you all closer because I don't even have my laptop because <laughs> I came straight from the protests. So we're going to go into Dan Schneider, but I just want to say something before we go into this. When someone doesn't personally come to you and apologize, it's not an apology. If you hear about it through other people, it's not really an apology, right? An apology is to the person that you hurt. That's what an apology is for. An apology like, for example, accountability is not like um, prestige or something. It doesn't give you some type of badge. Accountability is what makes us human. And if anything, it, it should make you personally feel better about yourself. You know? Like, how do you sleep without making sure that the person that you hurt doesn't know that you're sorry? And so I feel like an apology is something that's very personal. And when it comes to Hollywood, I think also, you know, the industry in general has gotten so used to um, public opinion and how everyone views them that they forgot about how the people closest to them view them. Those are the people that matter, right? the people that you harmed, or the people closest to you. Those are the people that matter. And when you're not centering them, you're centering something else. And I really truly believe that the victim, the survivor of that scenario, feels that. And so when I see Nickelodeon, and I see Dan Schneider, and I see them addressing everyone but, you know, us, or we see... Rich Carell and Beth Carell and, you know, talking to Us Weekly but not apologizing to Drake Bell and no one's reached out to Drake Bell, you know. These things mean something. Because who are you making a statement for? Ego? Ego? Or you as a human being? And I think us as, a hum as human beings matters the most. That's what matters the most. And when you apologize some, to someone, you, you make an effort and you apologize to them first, which is why Britney Spears is honestly really amazing. <laughs> she, she, for example, the first apology and honestly maybe the last, <laughs> um, she personally reached out to me and apologized to me and didn't make any excuses. She just apologized. And for example, when we do something like if we hurt someone, obviously there is a spectrum of that. But when we hurt someone, it doesn't make us bad forever, right? It doesn't. Accountability doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't. But when we don't take accountability, it stunts our growth towards being something better. You know what I mean? Why block the bloom of who we can be? And I think the only way we block that bloom is when we don't know how to take accountability because we think that stamps us with this infinite bad person trope. And I think that's harmful for everyone not just the people involved, but I think it's harmful for community because we need to teach one another that we can grow. We can. And we must actually have hope that we can grow. So it bums me out that Nickelodeon, you know, and Dan Schneider's doing it this way and how Will and Ryder from, you know, the Pod Meets World is doing it that way. People go, oh, you're making a big deal about it. I'm not. I, I, actually, I am making a big deal about it for a reason. <laughs> I'll tell you kind of, I am making a big deal about it because it, it has a massive impact 
the examples we're setting, especially public figures, child stars, for example, there are so many um, fans, you know, whatever you want to call it, fans, people that watch. And how are we setting an example? Like, what example are we setting? It means something. Are we enabling, you know, toxic behavior? Are we enabling um, people being harmful towards one another? Or are we, are we stepping in? Are we drawing a line? Are we wanting to create a better world or not? And so it's a big freaking deal how we show up in our interpersonal dynamics. This is where it starts. We can fight at Capitol Hill all day, but if we don't know how to build community, we're gonna fail. Because once the responsibility transfers over to us, what are we going to do? Do we understand what happens with power? Do we know how to treat one another? Do, have we developed the skill set? If every bad guy disappeared today, because that's another thing, is that we learn this behavior. Generational trauma, right? We learn this type of behavior. If we're not cycle breaking, how are we gonna break anything? Every bad thing could disappear today. And how are we showing up in our interpersonal dynamics? That's what matters the most first. I really do believe that. I really do believe that. And so we need to focus on that. We need to show up for one another. We need to know what it means to support one another. We, we need to know the impact of wanting to change the world. Like, what does that truly mean? It means looking in the mirror. It does. And so, you know, okay, we're going to go into Dan Schneider's thing, but that's, that's <laughs> my long spiel of what I feel going into it is just I, I would have appreciated if Dan, you know, apologized directly. Like to me, for example, right? He was a bully, a meanie, and impacted my life, right? And instead of going on a podcast, I wish he just called me and instead of calling me in 2019 or his lawyer to like get me to sign NDA and whatnot, like where's the phone call of an apology? How come you can do all of this, right? Like how can everyone do all of this but not reach out to the person that they hurt? So, Let's listen to it. I'm like a little bit nervous, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people are here and we're gonna watch it together. Um, it seems like Dan Schneider's going on like a apology tour. I never thought that would happen. I wonder if Devin Werkheiser is gonna be the opening act. Anyone see that? This is why survivors don't come forward, by the way, because we become a joke. Trauma's never funny. Not funny. So let's get into this. Let's, I guess, let's begin. I'm ready. All right, give me one second. Give me one second. Um, <sighs> if you guys reset your browsers, uh, Melanie just made us, Bubblegum Bite just made us a new emote, the spilt tea emote. Oh my God, Melanie. And Melanie was there. Melanie and, and Nico made this um, blimp. This is all Melanie and Miko. This was Miko's idea. This is so amazing. Look, look, look what happens when like allies, like people come together. It can be creative too. That, that's also something I hope that people maybe take from e-predators is like, or what I've learned um, is you can get creative with it and it can become something that isn't just such a drag. It's already a drag, but you can make something of it. Come up, let's see. Yep, there it is. Melanie, I love you. Here, and this is for her as well. It's Britney, bitch. <laughs> it's Britney, bitch. Uh, the blimp is so good. We got off Craigslist. Like, Miko had to go drive and, like, get the... 
<laughs> and then they spray painted it. You know, so much goes into all of this. Melanie is amazing. Which I, and also thank you to all the Patreon members and members on YouTube. Like, this is community built. We don't have any corporate sponsors. So how you all contribute is what keeps us going. So um, thank you for making it, you know, I'm, it's still an uphill, but like you all are helping make this sustainable in one way or another. And so like, let's show these bad guys, like what happens when we all come together and, you know, make activism, for example, um, sustainable for everyone. Oh my God. All right, are we ready for this? All right, who's the person, Matthew, Alexa, did Disney and CN have allegations too? I mean, Disney, that's a whole other, we'll, we'll get into Disney later, but you know, we'll, we'll get into that. Christian, thank you so much for posting that. Survivorhood is powerful. Yay, yay, yay. Okay, so let's, um, I guess, begin. Who, can someone say in the chat, who is this person interviewing him? <laughs> I just want to know, like, who? Okay, let's go. Hey, it's Boogie. I play T-Bow on Nickelodeon's iCarly. I got a chance to watch the Quiet On Set program, and I reached out to Dan to see if it was something that he'd be willing Pause. to discuss. I'm pleased to say that- Pause. Boogie. You're an adult. You reached out to Dan after watching Quiet On Set? I didn't get a message from you. Did anyone else get a message from you? Like the actual kids, by the way, that were affected by Dan. You reached out to Dan after watching that documentary? So it's my first red flag. Yeah, thumbs down. Can we give a thumbs down for this? Are you sure? I th should we not? Already. Should we, should we hear him out a little bit before he thumbs down? Or? All right. Okay, wait, okay let's, yeah, we'll let's hear him out. Okay, okay. But yeah, I'm yeah. already like, no, 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 no. Okay, let's go, let's go. Um, okay, yeah, I just want to see who this bo bogey. Okay. Yeah, boogie. Boogie. You say boogie or bogey? He said and boogie. He said yes. Okay. I'm just traumatized. Dan, how he said are yes. You? I'm okay. I'm okay. <gasps> Holy um, shit. Holy really shit. Okay, wait, wait. Oh, out. hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. No, I'm already. I'm. I, I already know my decision. Boogie, the fact that you reached out to Dan and not everyone who literally put their careers on the line. There was a, a costume designer that wouldn't even show her face. She was behind clothes. Do you understand what we did, Boogie? Do you understand what we did? Creating change here, dude. And you reach out to the bad guy. <laughs> Not forever bad. You know, you can always one day become, you know, an actual accountable human being, but the guy who harmed everyone. You reach out to that guy? I'll also say like it's on it's on Dan's fucking Yeah, it's on Dan channel. Warp. His warped mind. I can't like I could give maybe him the benefit of the doubt of like using the moment to be like getting some views of like having Dan on. Like that would, you know, I, I can. No, but Dan, of course, steals all the views. Like how much money, Dan, are you making off of this? Um, whatever. Is Boogie the last one left? What's well, like, yeah, let's. Um, In this scenario. It already has 70,000 views. Yeah, 70,000 views. And then the protest is how much, right? How many did we get, the, get at the protest? And there's like already a thousand. I don't know, like we're at. 8,000, <laughs> like not that, we're not 70,000. And it just no, goes to show crazy. you everyone's want, you know, whatever, let's play it, let's play it. And giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we saw over the last two nights. I'm really glad you're here because I believe this is important. For sure. Uh, we've got a lot of things to unpack. Um, but before I dive into my list of topics that I'd like to discuss, is there anything you'd like to start off with? Absolutely. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Pause, pause, Let's talk Dan. About the Dan, Boogie, Boogie and Dan. Boogie, did you watch the Ariana Grande footage, for example? He's embarrassed? Like, I mean, sorry, him centering his own, what he feels, it's bizarre to me. It's like, you literally, you are awful. To be quite honest with you, awful. 
You're embarrassed. Not embarrassed enough. Not embarrassed enough to like go reach out to the people that you actually harmed. Oh, we have some. We have a little backstory on on the boogie. Uh, boogie. Boogie is Melanie also experienced. Davis. Oh, racism on the iCarly set. So this is all kind of messed up. That's horrible. What is happening? Right, he's being used as like this. He is being the, used yeah. by Dan. And yeah. that's like, you know, that's another thing I talk about a lot is like predatory behavior. And like as his position as being a black man, he's being used. Totally. Which is like even just. Worse right now. Yeah. I mean, this is all like a, a whole bunch of mess up, like messed up. Okay, let's go. I'm, I'm already like not down. Watch this. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Uncomfortable, you exploited children. You CUM shot. You, sorry, my like, oh yeah, it's like as if he just like, I don't know, one day had a fit or something. It's how he's acting. Like it was just this, I'm sorry. Like it was just this one time event. People were just like affected by it. These are, ch Dan, children. Children that you exploited. That's still streaming, by the way. That now, for example, these Ariana Grande videos are on YouTube and now they're in a dock, sadly. You did that. I don't, I don't even feel any remorse from him. He's not even crying. He's not even, you know, I know everyone deals with their own emotions in their own way, but I don't feel anything from you, Dan. I don't feel a thing. All right, let's. Let's continue, I guess. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No, no, and I, I don't mean to cut not you off, but cool. if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say. No writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was participated. leaving the room, um, it embarrasses me, I shouldn't have done it. Um, Stop saying it embarrasses you. I can tell you It's embarrassing it and horrible really for the two. For me. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences. Embarrassing for you, dude, stop it. There were two women splitting a salary. You're embarrassed. I'm gonna cut to the chase here. You don't feel anything, Dan. You're like every freaking, um, privileged, male, white male, I've honestly ever met on set. You don't even know what accountability is. You have no idea what it is. You're searching for it maybe, but you haven't landed on it. That's for sure. This is not the way. I don't want to have to watch this. I would have so rather gotten a letter from you, for example, apologizing genuinely than having to like witness the whole world watching whenever the hell this is. And then Boogie being like, not cool. I'm sorry, Boogie. I also have to say that it's not even like not cool. It was beyond not cool. It was two women splitting a salary and Dan Schneider apparently had CP on its computer and was ask, asking women constantly to massage him. And then having a woman across the desk pretending she was blank. Not cool. The simplest thing he did in that documentary was make those women split a salary 
And even that is criminal. Yeah. And then you got the um, S-O-D-O-M-Y. Not cool. You see how guys talk with one another? Not cool. The bro talk. Is this a bro talk going on? Is this locker room? For like a new, like, I guess, more evolved-ish version of locker room talk? It wasn't cool. Dude, it was like beyond that. That's kind of downplaying what actually uh, occurred, so. Whatever. Let's see. <laughs> in the entertainment business, I was green. I was scared. I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that the, and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should have. And I wish I could go back and fix that. Um, and in the writers' room. Sorry. There's no doubt that sometimes those jokes. But wait, wait, wait. Also, by the, the way, Dan Schneider didn't sit down for quiet on set. Look at where how he's choosing. You have to remember, so predatory behavior, right? Is the power dynamic. When they're not in control of something, they don't want to deal. They they don't engage. He didn't sit down for quiet on set to explain his behavior. See how he who he is sitting down with and the dynamic between them two. This is what I've been talking about for a while. They're all about power and control. <laughs> and when they're not in power and control, they don't associate with that. And it's clear as day for me with Dan Schneider in this, whatever this is. This is typical, it's like covert narcissism, honestly. things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um, that was wrong and that that was because you know I was an inexperienced producer I was immature wouldn't happen today but um, I'm just really sorry it happened yeah now we know you've had a lot of success <laughs> over two decades thousands of people have worked with you for you okay. what are these seats the by the way who did not have a good experience with you they're so okay ugly. I would like they're to speak so to those people because I hate that anybody worked for me and didn't have a good time you know me you've been on my sets um well, see there's a power dynamic look, i've had some wait stop pause you're a little sneaky schneider <laughs> i can't i said that you're, you're a little sneaky schneider you're sneaky you see what you did there i want you to watch this back yourself alone you worked for me because you wanted somebody who worked for you. This is all about power and control, Dan. You're still doing the same thing you have been doing, but now you know, for example, this is why with predators, you take something away, they'll find a way around that. They evolve with like the scenario, with the situation. They literally, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not evolve, but like, God, there's a word I'm missing here. They'll figure out a way to get access to what it is that they need access to, no matter what. And so now he's being called out for his bully behavior, this, that. He now knows how to control the narrative through how it's being perceived by who he is being interviewed with. That's the whole point of having Boogie. Boogie, by the way, he should have reached out to us first instead of Dan Schneider because I would have given you a few um, pointers before going into that interview. He's using you. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think Boogie actually reached out to him. I'm sure Dan reached out to Boogie and was like, yeah, it's like writer, right? Yeah, like writer. Writer said that Brian Peck, um, that he, you know, Brian Peck reached out to them, but in writer's letter, he said that he reached out to Brian and it's like this whole like, with tag. Um, but regardless, Boogie, you're, you're, did you not watch the doc? Oh, yeah. People are saying in the chat the word you were looking for is adapt. Adapt. Thank you, chat. Adapt. Predators adapt. I mean, like in the wild, like literally. <laughs> they adapt. And Dan Schneider is currently adapting. He's adapting and it's looking poorly on him, to be quite honest. Boogie, I'm so sorry, but... From my point of view, you're being used here. What Dan Schneider just said right there, he was he wanted that situation so he can go, you worked with me. And then you're put into a situation where you're validating more his experience and not others that have come forward.
You see how it works? I mean, I don't you know see how it works? It, I love it. Someone said we have the same brains, Alexa. Yeah, exactly. Everyone, you, we, we see it. It's so simple, too. Predators think they're so smart. It's really, once you, you see it. Would you be open it, to uh, asking uh, Boogie himself how that happened? Yeah, Boogie. O open invitation? Boogie, if you want to um, instead also then reach out to the people who were part of the Quiet On Set documentary and have a conversation, I would love to have a conversation with you. Because I actually think that is important to do. Because I don't know what that is. That's not being an ally to the child stars. Um, was Boogie a child on iCarly? I just want to know. Like, let the chat. I have a feeling he was an adult on set, right? So if Boogie, if you were an adult on set, for example, um, yeah, you should probably reach out to the children, right? Um, who have something to say about Dan Schneider. This is not being an ally. This is not what allyship looks like. You're being an ally with Dan Schneider but pretending this is like a neutral conversation, but there's a power dynamic here. There's a power dynamic. All right, sending support Alexa. I don't know if I can watch the rest. <laughs> that really doesn't get better. If he was trying to take accountability in this, um, I didn't hear it. No, no, let's, let's, let's keep watching. No, he's not. Silly. Um, by the way, just to comment, I mean, he turned the uh Comments yeah, off. the comments, of course, are off. Yep. Not shocking he does, at all. He doesn't want to hear what other people No, he have wants to say, Boogie, you know. who he, who's worked for him. You know, maybe we get it. Employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20 years, who would work with me again. But um, not everybody. There's a, still a significant number that didn't have Look what a you're doing. You're weighing it. So oh, there's some people who would work with me again. There's a lot of people that won't. Jen Schneider, how old are you? <laughs> Average isn't nearly high enough in that area. Um, and the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that I would let the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year, I would let that pressure get to me, which a good boss should never, ever do. Were there specific things that you were doing? Sh sure. I would um, snap at people sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have sometimes. given them a nicer answer. Um, I would not give when people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. And watching <laughs> that Wait, show, please be so is happening right now he even sees it he doesn't even know what to do but Boogie, you see it i see that you see it you see it too right what he's doing oh yeah sometimes i was snarky sometimes i put kids on their back and said i'm thirsty with water i just sometimes sometimes i ask for kids feed on twitter sometimes sometimes i meet like women um you know split salaries you know just sometimes yeah the, i let the pressure get to me so i'm just like making people split it's, their salary it's male privilege it's also white male privilege specifically also is the pressures on them and so no one understands the pressure that someone in dan schneider's position yada 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 i know it's like no made up sympathy pressure too it's, it's like, made it's up like, pressure dude, nobody cares about your tv shows correct it's like not that important and even if it was that important it doesn't excuse your behavior, right? So it doesn't. There's also great bosses, by the way. There's people who are under more immense pressure than Dan Schneider, for example, and they don't behave this way. So that's why it was. Imp it's important. Dan's like having this conversation with Boogie, eh, not doing it on quiet on set because it's an echo chamber that he's created in this interview. It's an echo chamber. Right. If and turning the and comments turning off. off. The comments, yeah. Because if you step into the conversation nick alexa been a fan of you since my childhood i didn't say thank you for being a part of my child sending you my support from upstate new york thank you so much nick but this is the echo chamber he's and this is very predatory now remember pre predator is not just essay predatory behavior is shows up in many different ways it's preying on people's weaknesses and exploiting that that's a predator so you know don't get it mixed up that it's just like essay predator essay you know Predators come in all different, like, all different types of predators out there. Capitalism is like one big predator, for example, right? So there's many different ways. And you can see he's such a predator. I'm sorry, Dan, like you are. Look how you're preying on this boogie situation. This is like just obvious. Let's, let's, let's continue. Oh. It made me... There were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call some of those people and say, I'm so sorry, and you let's picked talk up about it. And I, I... Ah, 
sorry, I'm getting triggered. You had your lawyer pick up the phone and call me to basically sign an NDA. Sometimes, look at his face right there. Sometimes I like think about picking up the phone. Pick it up then. Pick it up. Somehow your lawyer found my, my, the person I was dating at the time, by the way. They didn't even get connected to me. He was working at fucking Ace Hotel in Palm Springs and gets a phone call from Dan Schneider's lawyer. I don't even know how he found his number. But some day, I just, sometimes I want to pick up the phone and make an apology, but I don't. But I do all this, though. I put all my effort into this in making me the victim and baby, baby, baby. A baby. It's like, pick up the phone. Don't say you want to. Pick it up. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Like, hello? Hello? Okay. Dan, what's next, dude? This is like, not, well, okay. Wish you'd had a better time, and I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. Now, you've written hundreds <laughs> of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. But currently, where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes some people think. are inappropriate for children. Mm -hmm. Boogie! Sorry, can we pause? I'm, I'm, Boogie, not some people think. The people that were harmed are talking. Do you understand the difference with that? This isn't like online um, chatter. This is people actually who worked for Dan as children, like myself, saying it was inappropriate and that I felt exploited. This isn't some people. Stop, I, I, don't, I don't like that, that you called us some people. We aren't some people. We are people that put our asses on the line, to be quite honest with you, to speak the truth of what happened to us while we were working for Nickelodeon and Dan Schneider. We're not some people. And we won't be remembered as that either. All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, <laughs> every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. Okay, um, now we have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens. Here's the years again. And they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid's show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show. Just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 oh, years ago. Cut it. I want my shows to be Dan, popular. I want everyone on. to. Dude, come on. Dan. First of all, there's so many comp there's so many issues with what he just said there. Because first of all, kids can find many things funny. But when adults are in control of the jokes, for example, you can manipulate the child into receiving image content in such a way that has a, a, an impact on them, right? And he's acting as though what he created, I can't say enough about the slap. Like, I do want to just, sorry, to keep bringing it back to Ariana Grande because I think that was when he, he got fired, in my opinion, shortly after that. That was like his peak, right? Like everything was um, edging towards that type of behavior it was always predators do this they they try to figure out where is the boundary that's why community we have to be very safeguarding when it comes to predatory behavior because it's us that make sure that they don't edge their way to what Air, the ariana grande content became right like we have to we have to be aware that they're constantly trying to figure out where the fine line is and where people create that line that content wasn't just kids finding it funny. You were putting straight up, I mean, I don't even know I, without saying this without saying it. Like this was webcam, like this was, you know what it was, Dan. And kids are viewing it. And what, what he's not saying is you're not understanding the, the children that are watching this and what you're creating. 
in a generation. And we get how you view women, by the way, Dan. You make them split salaries, pretend they're being essayed to read lines. Like me, for example, just boy crazy. I didn't have a mind at all. I was just boy crazy and dumb and didn't know how to play basketball. Cute. Blech. <laughs> Grown man, we know what you think about girls and women. And what you're not taking accountability for is how you are hyper normalizing your archaic mentality onto the next generation. You're fucking it up for us all because we're supposed to be evolving. You are actually blocking that. People like you block evolution. <laughs> That's what you do. You're perpetuating an archaic, weird perception of reality and hyper-normalizing it to children where their brains haven't developed yet. Duh. The more people who like the shows, the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to say with your work. Big mm -hmm. to say. If it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem. Oh cut it. my cut it. God. I mean, that's a solution. It's bad any era, Dan. Putting a, a, a child on their back saying I'm thirsty is bad any era. Making a child say this shirt makes me look chesty is bad any era. Making a woman split, women split a salary is bad any era. Having um, uh, pornography, whatever you want to call it, on YouTube, on your laptop, in a work environment, bad in any era. But you see, the escape of accountability comes with them putting it through the lens of like the era. It's like, no, 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 no. It was bad every era, Dan, okay? You can put it in any era, you're bad. Just like what you're doing right now is bad. You're using somebody who worked for you to control the narrative of what you did. You did not sit down for quiet on set, and I know it. I heard. I heard you didn't sit down for quiet on set because you weren't in control there. Nice try, buddy. The, the last thing I want to ever do yeah. is put any content in a show that's going to upset my audience and make them want to turn off the TV. Why would I ever want to do that? That makes sense. I want to give you an opportunity to kind of elaborate on something. Okay. It's an echo chamber. The thought process from the series is you had the power to just write a joke and no matter what, it's going on TV. You just had that type of power. Is that true? The, the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Yeah, we okay. know Russell there were spoke many, for you. Many levels of scrutiny. Okay? We had executives in LA. We had executives in New York. So two coasts. Two coasts. Okay. Of, of, of approval. I love yes. that and being and like, like so, 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 stage, there was really. wait, okay. wait. I'm talking about but there was there was other people allowing you to do the, the really bad stuff. Okay. So there was a lot of people allowing you to the, do the bad stuff. That doesn't excuse you did the bad stuff. But they're trying to put the focus, which I actually, I mean, obviously, e predators, like, I like putting the focus on the people that were allowing the bad stuff to happen. I do. It's important to. But I don't like when the person who did the bad stuff is trying to shift blame onto the people that were allowing them to do the bad stuff. That's where I draw the line because he's not, then not taking full accountability. He's trying to say, people allowed me to do this. And like, because they allowed me to do it, then it couldn't have been that bad, right? And like, what is your beef with Nickelodeon, you and Russell? I am positive you and Russell got fired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because it wasn't Dan 101, <laughs> and it wasn't um, I, Dan, <laughs> and it wasn't Dan and Josh, and it wasn't the Dan show, right? Sorry, I finally got to say that. That felt awesome. <laughs> yeah? Move it away from my, my face? Oh, okay. Um, okay. 
But I want to say what I'm saying <laughs> because I think he, he got fired with a $7 million severance plan, essentially. Right? And then Russell Hicks stepped down effective immediately. These are men that have, they don't like Nickelodeon too. <laughs> But we don't like Nickelodeon for different reasons. You know what I mean? Which is weird to think about. But we, we all don't like Nickelodeon. Russell, Dan, you know. But for very different reasons. And you can tell Dan and Russell, for example, are trying to shift blame onto Nickelodeon. It's so obvious. Like, I want to picture, like, Russell and, like, Dan, like, on the phone having conversations. Like... It's probably them scape, like figuring out how to put Nickelodeon under the bus for, you know, le letting them go. Right? Is this not obvious? I mean, it's obvious to me. I see someone just said, uh, Dan how and Kel. How long until Dan gets the ukulele out? What did it say? How long until Dan gets the ukulele out? Said, um, hilarious. Only Gio for the, the Kona Hawaii back there? No, for the um, because of uh, that the other chick I forgot her name that did the ukulele apology. Oh, um, wow, I can't. Uh, Ber Sings. Berlinger, wait, what's her name? Uh, currently, oh my, I can't even think right now. They're all blending together. But yes, the ukulele apology. This is honestly weird. This is this is just as weird, I guess. It's it's getting up there. Wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup, sound, sets, and danger, dialogue, jokes, everything. No, when you say approval, these obviously that's a hierarchy. See, it's beef with Nickelodeon. Right. Wait, Nickelodeon, okay. no, I love no, it. My Nickelodeon, no, these are my it's so great. No one likes you. Even the the bad guys don't even like you. See what happens when conversation starts. Colleen, Colleen Ballinger, yeah. Colleen yes. Ballinger. <laughs> See what's happening though, Dan. I know what you're doing here, buddy. You're not that clever, by the way. Just you remember, you wrote kids shows, right? You're not bosses that and then clever. Their, Go on. Bosses and then their bosses. And they're approving all of this stuff. Okay. Okay? And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults and caregivers and the set teacher and, and the families. Everybody's watching it. And if anybody had said anything, hey, we don't like that. That's not appropriate. You then, it would have been cut out. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit sure. because the series <laughs> painted you in this way. Push back the, from the beginning, you, Boogie. Boogie's now is like, I'm, now I gotta push back. What is it gonna be? It's gonna be a, not even, these chairs. I can't get over these. What are these chairs? Jen, what's weird is you can smell fire through all four episodes. Well, it turns out that's just Dan Schneider's pants being on fire for being a liar. Yeah, he is liar, liar, hands on fire. Ugh. We were just the guy that was doing what he wanted. And people were afraid to confront you about things. So say, just humor me, say Correct. that that was the case. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay. If nobody on the set, if all of the <laughs> dozens and dozens of... We already, we already set, practiced this. If they didn't right. say anything, if my bosses <laughs> said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you've got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. Dude, we Let know that. Week. Oh my God, look at it. I feel even Boogie's face right here right now, just being like, but like, dude, we got it. We know that there's higher ups above you, like people that are your friends. But you have to remember also, Dan Schneider, you were friends with everyone above you. This was a culture that was being created amongst you uh, men, by the way. This was a culture you were creating and participating in and hypernormalizing. So you doing this, saying there's people above you that have to give a green light, we got that. I feel like the only reason that now you're mentioning that is because you are under public scrutiny and you have beef with Nickelodeon because they put you in a tent and didn't allow you to interact with, your, with the actors. We read Jeanette McCurdy's book, dude. We know what was happening. You were actually put away over there. That's how like bad you were. Nickelodeon was like, because uh, the Me Too movement, like, uh, and they put you over there and you couldn't even, like, you were like sending notes to like give directions. And then you say, in the, in the um, Quiet on Set doc, you said as a statement that that wasn't what was happening, that you just chose to like send notes. You 
chose to send notes to the actors. Come on, dude. You're, that's embarrassing. Now that if you said, oh, what I said there was embarrassing. I can't believe I actually try to lie to the public about that. That's embarrassing. You obviously have some sting when it comes to Nickelodeon. You and Russell. And it's showing. Is oh, it God. just me or does this dude look like Peter Dinklage? Oh, yeah, he does kind of look like him a little bit. But don't ruin Peter Dinklage. I I'm love sorry. Peter Dinklage. I'm sorry. We love Peter Dinklage. Yeah, like we were like, <laughs> oh, no, now I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it and be like, no, don't ruin it. Don't ruin Peter Dinklage. Don't do it. Kind of hit close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, being a new father, I wouldn't my be opposed of, to my child being in the Peter's industry. catching strays Doesn't out matter here. what age. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing some of those on-air dares, seeing it now from where you are now in your life, now. what do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. Nickelodeon wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. Nickelodeon. At the time, we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the All That cast. So we get with the writers and we come up with all these ideas and it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of fear factor sure. and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. But we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could do. We would uh, uh, give when them to the network and they would say, one, tell us the ones that were okay. Right. Those are the ones we shot. Those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication Boogie's that like, any kid ever had no. a problem with them. But when I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dares. And it breaks my heart, and I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly, but if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it, yeah. period, the end. Right. And if I had known at the time, I, I would have changed it. You were spot. exploiting, dude. Look at his face there. Come on, Dan. Know, bo bo Boogie has to push back and say, like, dude, you created an environment Correct. where people couldn't do that. say anything. Correct. And also, why were you allowing children? You're the adult. You should know the power dynamic, what's happening. You were exploiting children for Nickelodeon. Is that what you're trying to say? Is that Nickelodeon was coming up with these ideas, wanted to do Fear Factor, yada, 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 and that you were just like, helping Nickelodeon out <laughs> and also exploiting the children. Do you think the children in that situation would ever feel that they could tell you that they were uncomfortable? You would fire them. Remember what you would say to people? What did you tell Jeanette McCurdy? She'd be working at Yogurt Land if it wasn't for you. Remember that? Now, we also saw the series highlight two former writers of yours, two women, mm -hmm. who spoke about a wage discrepancy. Now, I know that you don't divvy out salaries. Talk to me about that part. Well, you're correct. <laughs> I have nothing to do with paying writers. I never have. I've never made a writer's deal. And of all the writers I've been in the writer's room with, I never even knew how much most of them were getting paid. Yeah, but we <laughs> saw these two women who were writers for you sharing one salary. How mm -hmm. does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes you'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for Pause your first it. job, what about, wait, is, is Boogie going to say, is Boogie going to talk about having the, that, that female writer, by the way, having to um, pretend to be um, S-O-D-O-M-I-Z-E-D? That you had something to do with. And there was an NDA involved, right? Nickelodeon was protecting you. Give me a break, Dan. You are embarrassing. The job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers, and where? they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer, and they split a salary. So and these are all first-time writers. All first-time writers looking for their first gig. Got it. Now in the series. Nice one. 
they also highlighted two black actors who said that they felt. Wait, you're not gonna talk about the S O D O M I. Why? Look how they just like skate on through that. I know. It's like I mean, you can't just you can't be interviewing the dude and then like pick out the boogie man. The the most the least of the worst things. Mm-hmm. Boogie, I'm disappointed, man. You should have came to us first instead of going to Dan. I'm never going to speak on anyone else's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can talk about my experience, how my experience was with you, what I saw prior to working with you. But again, I don't want to speak on anyone's journey. What are you doing? Journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes. And the reason for that. Oh, is here it goes. Oh, no. Stop. This is really bad. Oh, my God. Wait, is this really happening? Did you see where that just went? Quiet. You saw where that went, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, man, Dan, you are a fucking mess, man. <laughs> You're a sad case. You can't help yourself, can you? That stupid chair. From one other stupid chair to another stupid chair, honestly. The vest is pretty fucking bad, too. Yeah, the vest is pretty bad too. The the layers, you just oh Dan, Dan, Dan. I don't get you, how his shoes got so like you know his shoes are like not bad, <laughs> but then he's like wearing this vest. Whoa, it's dude. so ridiculous, dude. My you shows? need you need costume. Oh, that's you right. They don't want to work with you ever again. Nickelodeon show I ever made. That's very evident, as it is in the second one. And then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel, and every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. I'm very proud of that. It's very important to me. Wait, can we turn up a little bit? I can't hear you. That they were in my I'm shows, like, Dan, I can't hear you enough. I'm I don't want to hear you, but at the same time, proud I do. Of the achievements they've had beyond my shows, and they've gone on to bigger and better things, and that gives me a great sense of pride. Well, something that really kind of bothered me was oh, what how bothered they you? depicted your relationship with the cast. Yeah, it bothered me too. Yeah, just me being there, I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood that in situations where they may have had turmoil, whether it be with their families, whether it be other castmates, they came to you versus how they made you Pause. look. With that said. Hey, Boogie, let's go full screen. Boogie. Not, not fully wrong there. When it comes to what you just said, that when something was wrong on set, people would go to Dan Schneider. I did go to Dan Schneider many times. And you know what he did? He bullied me. And he yelled at me in a room on Nick on Sunset with a bunch of other Nickelodeon execs around. They separated, I mean, they separated me from my mom in that room. For example, you're right. We did go to Dan, and boy, were we misled and disappointed by what happened when we would go to Dan. Dan was a bully. He was a bully. He's a mean guy. And now... He's trying to look like he's just this um, nice guy that, like, you know, kind of gets it and wants to blame everyone else. Dan, you know why I don't buy any of this shit as well is because you wouldn't sit down for quiet on set. You are controlling this whole interview. It's so obvious and sad. Yeah, I saw I saw a chatter say uh, this interview was was written and directed by Dan Schneider. Yep. Another, another, um, whatever, show by Dan Schneider, by Schneider's Bakery. Schneider's Bakery is on fire right now. There's nothing you can do to blow that out, by the way. Amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. and her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17 and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors, at least at Volume the time. Volume is too low, someone's um, saying? And she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, 
her manager. Her Maybe publicist. we should put CC on. Me, is there any captions on this? Part of her team thought of me that way. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated and it ended up not working out. She didn't. Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a moment. <laughs> there was also an incident where she had ran away from home. If yes. You would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some people may think, I think <laughs> it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. Oh, that said, let's talk about some whoa. of the things that have just been Boogie. swirling forever. Boogie, now we know why Dan Schneider chose you for this interview. I'm not gonna lie. My Lord, you, this is positive, how? You're gonna put this one isolated situation, spin it in a specific way in Dan Schneider's favor and not acknowledge multiple people sitting down on quiet on set, talking about the toxic work environment, et cetera. Come on, dude. You don't know what he's doing to you too? You don't see it? I hope someone sends it's a boogie. Dan Schneider? is still at it, <laughs> by the way. It's just a little bit different now, but it's the same. Yeah. Oh yeah, we can talk in, I can talk in chat. Also, we can take a break. Can we take one second because I might have to, can I do a, a, a bathroom break? And then you go. Okay, okay. All right, I'll talk to chat right now. How is, let's bring, let's bring you all closer. <laughs> How, how, how is everyone doing? What, what, are, what are the thoughts? I'm sorry, I'm like missing everything to be quite honest with you. So I'm <laughs> like, what's happening? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, like people don't understand when it comes to predatory behavior, they're, they're, they're constantly looking for people that no, I, I want to rephrase that because that can also be seen as victim blaming. They're just constantly trying to control people, gain access to them, and get them to hypernormalize their behavior or perpetuate their own personal perspective. So that they're, I mean, it's all brooming. It's brooming people into what they're doing. Jaden, Jaden, you're here. I want you to have the opportunity to interview Dan, does someone say? Dan needs to write a, I mean, I'm talking about, I need a handwritten letter. <laughs> I need a hand, I mean, there needs to be serious accountability. I love that he said, I mean, I don't love, but you get what I mean. That he said, oh, I, I, I think about picking up the phone all the time and I don't. It's like, you had your lawyer pick up the phone in 2019 when you were getting word that there was a documentary, like another person was creating a documentary about him about the toxic work environment. And his lawyer called me. I mean, he didn't call me. You don't, you didn't do shit when no one knew publicly, by the way. Like you didn't know. No one knew. And when, I mean, people knew they were speculating, right? But they couldn't know for sure. And Dan was preying on that then. Now with the documentary and the press and then this and then that, like he, he can't do it anymore. And so now he's trying to find a new angle of how to manipulate the public. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, use, a, I'm gonna use the restroom. We're gonna, we're gonna continue, but I do need to use the restroom. I'll be right back. And I'm here. Did you read any of the memberships or any of the donos? No, I saw, I saw only two memberships. Yeah, so she's on her phone, so it's hard. Are you good? Can you get under? She's on her phone, so it's hard for her to see everything coming in. So let's, let's see. Let's see what I can see. All 
All right, I'm going to start read off some of these members. Evil Mason, Dinner Party, Let's Go, W. Um, Nick, Code, Nick Code, W, Munchies, Let's Go. Macaroni Tony, Dinner Party, W. Viper, Munchies. That's all I can see up to now. Let's see. Okay, look, let, let's get some. Let's let's look at the donos here. We got Arthur Vega with the ten dollar dono or just super chat or something, whatever that is. Thank you, thank you. Melanie Davis K. Isn't splitting salary still illegal? Um, so I actually don't know about that. I think if they are in the union. I mean, I just, I just don't know. I mean, it depends on the contract. Here, let's look it up. Salaries illegal in California. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, just sit down. I'll do it, I'll do it. You sit down, yeah. Um, the mic is low. Oh, that's just my mic. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. I'm back. <laughs> As I'm typing, I'm back. Um, okay. Just to answer that last question, I don't know if the, I don't know if it's illegal. I Wait. think it is. Wait, what is it? They're asking if splitting the salary is illegal. I think it is. I think it is. And I, I, and, and, and him like, okay, Dan, sure. Why don't, why don't you bring the, the men that you had split salaries or whatever onto the podcast episode with Boogie? You know what I mean? Like what, what, where, where are they now? And also like, no, that's not, that's not appropriate. You don't have someone like share. And, th and that also shows like the way that they were exploiting he said, like, oh, people, you know, their first show, they're, like, wanting the first show. This is my whole point, is that they exploit that. They exploit and prey on people's wanting to have a job. But they ruin people's careers and passions and what they're passionate about. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's why it's a they're, problem. They're, they're preying on their vulnerability. Correct, they're on, their vulnerability. on their vulnerability. Vulnerabilities, yeah. Well, Dan makes a bunch of money, and, you know, Dan was never in that situation, right? You, you never heard him say, I had to split my salary. Right, yeah, he has no idea what that even means. He has means. no idea what that even means. All right. Oh, we got a $20. Trisha, uh, oh, heart to you as well. Thank you so much. Boogie, though. Boogie, come on, man. You were banned from your set. Never, never, oh, never you're happened. Saying... That is a false rumor. What happened? Add it to the list of false Talk rumors. Talk to me, what happened? They were adult actresses at the time, and they had their own specific reasons for not wanting to do the show anymore. Mm. I'm not judging that. It got tense, and what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. Okay. So I, I decided I'm going to do what most showrunners do, which is you're not on the set. There's a director there to shoot it. I'll go up to the writer's room. I'll work on the next script. But yeah. because everybody was so used to me caring about every detail of every show so yeah. much, for me not to be on the set, yeah, maybe some people thought I got banned. So it was more of an assumption. So you're saying, hold on, this hold guy's on. usually here. Here he is with his beef with Nickelodeon again. So, like, you're saying that Nickelodeon never did anything. Either way, this is not so good for any of you. So, you're saying there was an investigation happening. You're saying Jeanette McCurdy's a liar, by the way. Nice. You're saying that even during an investigation about your toxic work environments, <laughs> that Nickelodeon didn't do anything, that you just chose. And even if that was true... Thank you for letting us know more about Nickelodeon. 
Thank you for letting us know more about Nickelodeon. Uh, Max Mello, how do you feel what Drake said about Dan? Uh, well, I mean, it makes sense what Drake said about Dan. You know, when it comes to no one else reaching out to you and like Dan reached out to Drake and that's his personal experience, right? And no one can take that away from him. So, I mean, I, I respect Drake's experience with Dan. There's nothing else I can do but respect Drake's personal experience with Dan. Just like the letters, right? We read those letters and how people said, well, my personal dynamic, I didn't see Brian Peck do X, Y, and Z. That doesn't change the fact that Drake Bell was essayed as a child by Brian Peck. So we can hear people have their own individual experiences, but that doesn't change what happened for everyone else, right? So it's very important to differentiate that. I, and I think Drake would agree with me. He would understand that he could have that experience, just like other people have had with bad people. <laughs> And then, you know, there's just different experiences that people have. So, I, you know, I have to only respect Drake's personal experience with, with Dan because he was a survivor, he is a survivor, and Dan was reaching out. I still think it's peculiar that Dan was the one who, like, knew. That's a little, it, it strikes me a bit odd that Dan Schneider called Drake and was like, is it you? How do you know that? Guess we'll never know, right? But I can I can't do anything but respect the experience that Drake had with Dan. Boogie though right now. <laughs> Boogie right now is just what are you doing, Boogie? This is wild. Oh, wait, who's this? This this is our boy, dude. What? That's our boy T Tebow from iCarly. Someone said oh. isn't that Tebow from I Carly in the chat, and so I looked it up, and that this is who he is. Okay. All right. Oh no, I, I I'm not even saying anything right now. Let's thank you for showing that, Josh. Alexa, what survivor such as yourself and now he's power? Har har har, hardy hard har. Joe, um, is it Josh? Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you for being here. Oh my God, Boogie. I don't know if it's an assumption. I don't know if somebody thought they were making me look bad by saying I got banned uh, from the set. I have no idea. Okay. All Jeanette? I know is I was never banned from the set. Yep. The darkest part of this series. Should have been. Many times. Discuss child predators. Now, I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. Why are you trying to clear it up? Brian. What, Boogie, why are you trying to clear it up? Why don't you go to... Uh, he's a lost cause right now, I guess. Um... All right, let's go. Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we watched last night. And next, I heard that he went to court when this guy was being tried, Peck. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Peck. A lot of them pretty famous. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency. And they knew mm. that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree. Mm -hmm. And they still did this. Correct. I, it's just, that's baffling that adults would do that. Oh, yeah. it's baffling and to you about adults doing that, but not baffling that you put a girl, a child, on her back saying, I'm thirsty with water. Come on, Dan. But my wrong? mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with. He's trying day, to cry. She came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech for the judge? And I said, Of course. And I did. 
and he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And wait, I'm sorry. Rewind. Wait, who? Wait, yeah, wait, 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 wait. Is that my Drake? To the judge. Wait, go back a little bit more. Damn. She came to me at the time. Drake's mom. And she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech to the judge? And I said, of course. And I did. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. And that here's was... the kicker that I really don't get after he got out of prison and was to my knowledge a registered sex offender he was hired on a disney channel show here he goes he's gonna put it into disney now too that um i never yeah i don't understand yeah I appreciate you sharing it, man. Are you okay? You want to take a minute? No, I'm all right. Let's keep going. Yeah. Oh, oh, Jesus. No. I think we really oh have some important things. We set the... What? Do you need to take a minute, Dan? Did you ever ask me if I needed to take a minute when I was puking in the trailer? And you told me, what now? And you handed me, tossed me a DVD player? And told me to get back on set? Or what about the lady working on two shows who you texted to come give you a massage on set? Correct. Like a fucking weirdo. Did like, there are so many things that are not mentioned here purposefully because he is the creator of this podcast episode. It's Dan's Warped Perception podcast, where we get to hear, like, Dan's warped opinion about everything and his... <laughs> his warped perspective on everything. You're like, oh, poor Dan. Not the children, but poor Dan. I was barely even a cry, by the way. Do you need a minute? Hmm? I was, I was being like... Uh, oh, yeah, like do you need anything? Do you, do you need a minute? <laughs> Record straight on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Before I let you get out of here, I appreciate the vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely things that you would have and should have done differently. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? A lot. Yes. There's yes. a lot, Boogie, that you did not discuss. But um, in fact, it was four hours of content for Quiet on Set about Dan Schneider. And you guys did this in 19 minutes? Yeah. Dude, Literally surprise. Asked him nothing. Literally didn't cover shit. And then his like half baked answers weren't even like pushed against. No. It was like, oh, okay, sure. Cool. Yeah. I, I helped uh, Drake's mom. Uh, 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 uh. Come on, Jim. Anything that if you could go back and navigate the, the journey differently, what would that look like? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's definitely things that I would do differently. Um, one that I think would be really, really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process okay i agree with for the that specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job that yeah. they really wanted to be on television yeah. maybe they should even be informed about what that means what's it going to mean if you're famous being what's exploited by predators what's it going to mean you know children like <laughs> like what are you going to say to the children like Oh my God, Dan. But I agree. I agree. That was actually in the protest, which is so wild to hear him saying that because in the protest, I said I wanted an onset therapist at all time. Um, at all times to be able to have like a professional there, you know, mental health uh, check ins, you know, the whole thing. But you're like, when he says to tell them what they're getting into, God, I think. That I, I don't know if that's really what it's for. It's, it's, it's more about allowing them to express how they're feeling to a professional, feeling that it is confidential, that it's not going to be told to someone, and then allowing them to come to the place where they maybe want to tell an executive or they want to tell their parent, right? So it's, it's not about telling them what they're getting into. It's, it's a 
that's kind of outside of set, I think, but it's about allowing the children to express how they're feeling so they can work through those feelings and, and make a informed, consensual decision and proper discernment when it comes to, you know, what's happening around them. You know what I mean? Yeah, rot and piss, Dan. This is 19 minutes of nothing? Rot and piss. <laughs> Did I miss something? Yeah, well, we, uh, you got five uh, gifted members from uh, <gasps> oh, Elizabeth, five gifted Lacey. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lacey. Elizabeth Lacey, that's so sweet. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Lacey. Just a reminder to everyone, like, this is completely community built. So everyone becoming a member, this is what helps all of this continue. And so thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here and contributing and just being awesome. Okay, is, is there an end to this? <laughs> What is this? Mean within your family. Let them find out. And then that way, if a kid doesn't want to be on a TV show, they can opt out. Yeah. That, that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, this kid is, is, doesn't want to do it, or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's going to come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't want to be there. Um, and additionally, the main thing that I would change you? is how I treat people and everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. The I could be best cocky of me. and definitely over ambitious and sometimes just straight I'm just up a man. rude and obnoxious. I'm just doing my job. So no one understands me. See this, was. it's a patriarchal thing. I, I'm, I'm just doing my job. Like I was just trying to get the best out of everyone. It was a lot of pressure. Like no one understands me. Wham, wham, wham. Meanwhile, exploiting children, creating a toxic work environment, Having female, you know, writers do what I said earlier, you know, there's um, corn like on his laptop. He's having the female employees there giving him massages, which is, by the way, SH. That's SH, by the way. Um, so many different things. Also, the slap and even calling it the slap, right? Like, who calls it the slap? when it comes to kids and when you end up witnessing it. And then also his tweets, like no one talks about his freaking tweets of him asking to have children send pictures of their feet. I mean, that's bizarre to me, you know what I mean? The feet thing, the, 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 the there, there's, there's so much there that he's not addressing. If you had nothing to hide, Dan, you would have done the quiet on set, Doc. And um, right. Penelope Tate. When I watched the show, I could True. see the hurt in some people's eyes, and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, Say it to I us. I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those Can't. earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now you're and kicked out. Do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. Oh, um, please, please. Like, look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids, and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I, I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure Wait, that pause everyone for a second. Wait. had a good experience. I just want to clarify with um, someone uh, just gave a super chat and said, what do you think about Arthur postcards from Buster? I don't know. Can someone, I don't know this. Can you let me know what you're talking about? I actually don't know what you're talking about. Please give me more information. Ah, oh, Dan. Give me next. That's what I do differently. Dan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you. Hey, it's Boogie. Oh, I my God. You couldn't do this on Quiet on Set. You had to create this whole very controlled yeah. environment. Yeah. Where it's like the whole thing is just... He is a... He's being... He's just not being accountable and he's only addressing the things he's choosing to address and that's not good enough and you know also just 
reach out to the people and, you know, see if they even want to have a conversation with you, right? But him also, they're not mentioning Jeanette McCurdy, which I found very interesting, because if we remember what Jeanette McCurdy said about the creator, you know, was, um, you know, the alcohol thing, too, and, you know, the bikini thing, and even it was uh, Danielle Monet. Uh, hopefully I'm getting that name right. We all had problems with what Dan was having us do, right? From short skirts to inappropriate content. He doesn't address any of that in this interview. This interview was strictly um, created by Dan. Actually, it was created by Dan's warped mind. Um, and now it's this covert version of him where he is still manipulating people, in my opinion. Dan, this is not it, dude. Like, you're you're the same but different, I guess, this time around. And I don't I I I, I don't like him putting boogie also. Like the, the whole thing is just very weird. Effie, welcome to the dinner party. Thank you so much for being here. Just bizarre. Just I don't forgive Dan Schneider. Not saying I'll never, right? But currently, right now, that made me a little bit more upset just because that just wasn't it. That wasn't proper accountability. That was avoiding a lot of the main um, discussions here that were mentioned in Quiet on Set. This was him playing the sympathy card, centering himself, playing the victim. He was a grown adult. Um, and we all know what he did, right? We all know what he did. It, it, it's clear as day. He, he, no matter how many boogie conversations he has, you know, that's not going to erase what's right in front of us and what we all have seen and know. Terry, Alexa, you remind me of Virginia. Who is that? Um, is that a compliment? Thank you yes. so much. Yes, Thank I've, you, Terry I've Jones. Thank you so much. So I want to, you know, Speaking of Dan and speaking of this type of behavior, I do, before I step out of the studio, I do want to uh, talk about Devin Werkheiser and the Neds declassified. Yo, she is the real Alexa. Wait, what happened? Someone's saying I'm not the real Alexa? I hope Alexa can give me a... Wait, who's saying... My mom's saying I'm, I'm the real Alexa. I am. Um... I want to talk about Devin Werkheiser, and I want to talk about that live TikTok that I watched a little bit. And obviously, you know, Drake Bell retweeted my tweet and retweeted the disgraceful snippet of Devin Werkheiser and Lindsay Shaw and Daniel, I think as well. Is that Daniel? Um, having this conversation about quiet on set. And now you already know, like I've, I've said, oh, my neck. <laughs> um, you already know I've said like a lot when it comes to how I have felt personally, how I've been treated publicly when it comes to Ned's Declassified cast and, you know, Chrissy Carlson Romano, right? For example, as well. And it kind of circles back to what I was saying earlier in this episode <laughs> is what accountability looks like. How are we as a community? How do we want to show up in people's lives? What is the impact and the effect we want to have on those around us? Sorry, I'm just feeling like... Um emotional I think from everything my brain's starting to have like that <laughs> like that overwhelming of everything as a survivor sorry That's exactly how I remember Devin Werkheiser. That's how I remember him when we were even younger. I remember him like that. I, I have a lot of memories looking back at parties that we would go to. And I remember him. Just like I remember other people as well, obviously. Um, but we're talking about Devin right now, right? 
I remember him and how he was and how he treated people around him, women, I mean, girls, I guess. And I'm not going there. I'm not going into that. But seeing how he made a joke, and there's no joke when it comes to trauma. We're talking about child essay, right? We're talking about child essay. It's very serious. And, and, and him saying in the clip, for example, that he uses jokes or humor to get through something, this wasn't his trauma. This wasn't his trauma that he was sharing. So he doesn't have the privilege of that, right? But he thinks he, did. he does, but he doesn't. Um, but to see him say what he said is exactly how I remember him. And how I remember all of the guys at Andrew Caldwell's apartment, all of them, just awful. Not good guys, right? <laughs> not, 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 not the best guys. What I, what I would see happen at Andrew Caldwell's apartment. Anyways, um, I just went into a daze there a little bit. <laughs> Um, but, but seeing him, it didn't surprise me, but it really did trigger me. And it was so disgraceful. Also the night of Drake Bell's episode where he is finally coming forward for the first time to the world and, you know, telling the world what happened to him. This guy, Devin Workheiser is, can we play the video? Can we find that? It's on my, um, we can find it. On, can we can find it on my Twitter. Let's let, let's let's watch it. Um, wait, where is it? Uh, where is it? It's like six million views. Wow, that really whoa, sixteen million views. Good, good. Um, I can you want me to text it to you, or do you want me to? It's on my Twitter. Yeah, it's on my Twitter. Mm-hmm. And I also texted to you, yeah. And if you go down a little bit, wow, 16 million. That's really impactful because power to survivors, right? Survivors are like sticking up for one another. And that's very important. Right? If we can't find allies nearby, I really want survivors to start you know, standing up for one another and having each other's back. I think it's, it's really important. Did you find it on my page? Oh, um, Miko just sent it in the chat. Thanks, Miko. Let's, let's play it. Yeah, 16 million views Coming. Daniel, I told you <laughs> Daniel, we told you never to speak about that Get back in your hole, Daniel and give me your holes Sorry, we shouldn't oh, joke about this. Oh, we really shouldn't. God, this is awful. Why are we doing this? Because this is about that? us. Listen, our set was not like that. Um, uh, and no, it's fucking awful. The, the, the Drake Bell shit is a, like, that's crazy to hear. I, I, that is yeah, fucked, man. And that never came out, which is really wild. You really are wild. so you shit. Talking about it. Boop. Ah. Uh, okay. Oh, so y'all were in on it. Oh, God. Damn. Wow. I'm not talking about this anymore. No. no. Not no. talking about no. this anymore. No. 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 Guys, we can't joke like this. Jesus. Guys, we're, we're, we're sometimes humor helps us move through things, yep. you know? 100%. We need Missy on the pod. Coming. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel. Oh, man. 
Maybe we can zoom in a little bit. So what Drake said there, by the way, can we scroll up a little bit? I just want to read what Drake said. What Drake, it was so epic. He um, said, Ned's declassless. This is wild. Laugh it up, guys. Laugh it up. Give me your holes. Really? Yeah, really? Let's hear, let's hear Devin one more time. Let's get a good look. <laughs> Daniel. Come <laughs> Daniel, I told you. Daniel, we told you never to speak about that. Get back in your hole, Daniel, and give me your holes. Sorry, we shouldn't joke about this. We really shouldn't. This is awful. Why are we doing this? Because this is about us. Listen, our set was not like that. Um, uh, and no, it's fucking awful. The, the, the Drake Bell shit is a, like, that's crazy to hear. I, I, that is fucked, man. And that never came out, which is really wild. Really wild. I'll tell you who was talking about it. Thanks, Lindsay. We all know oh. you're talking about uh. me. You guys just don't change. Right. Oh, so y'all were in on it. Oh, God. Damn. Wow. I'm not talking about this anymore. No, no. Wow, not just talking laughing about this anymore. No, no. Guys, we can't joke okay. like this. Jeez. So, so you see this, I think actually it comes very full circle, right? What Dan Schneider was talking about in his uh, warped uh, podcast show is... See how people can get in positions of power and where they start crossing lines and crossing boundaries and they turn things into just jokes. Right? And it starts like spiral and it can end up becoming harmful to those around them or near them. And by the way, Devin Werkheiser did apologize, but once again, it's a public apology not a private one, goes public. But what's sad about it is I even reached out pub privately for an apology from Ned's Declassified podcast when they called me crazy and Lindsay Shaw literally hearted um, a comment that said I was psycho and said that I was not a relevant Nick star. I mean, wow, this is where we're at right now? How much better it would be if we were together? They actually rolled up to a protest, for example, and stood up for the survivors that bravely... Um, came forward about their stories. But no, instead they're laughing in some weird green room. I don't even know where they are. It's bizarre, that whatever that room is. Um, laughing and joking about child essay. And this is how it all comes full circle, is if we don't know how to be in community with one another, we're never going to change the world, really. Because yes, we can identify bad behavior, outside of ourselves, but sometimes it's a lot harder to identify our own personal bad behavior and take accountability. And that might end up being the hardest thing to do. But that's where it really does start. And it's sad to watch that video because I feel like that's how they've been for a long time. This is how I remember Devin. This is how, you know, I'm sadly remembering Lindsay. I don't really understand, like, why you can't just apologize to me that my feelings were hurt about what you said. I don't think that's too much what, what I asked for, but I digress, or whatever the saying is. That wasn't okay. And that is why survivors don't come forward, for example, because people make that type of content, and not just that type of content, but friends, you know, for survivors outside of the industry without this type of platform will end up doing stuff at high school or middle school or whatever. This is just an amplified version of what most survivors deal with. And that's why it's so important for us to have survivors in mind when we're talking about them or we're talking about someone's trauma, that we keep them in mind and that we don't put ourselves, you know, first, that we think about them and we make sure that we're being mindful. I thought that was horrific what they did. And the 6 million views was well deserved because I think we need to start taking a hard look at how we talk about trauma and how we talk about survivors and how we talk about child essay, how we talk about essay and all of it. That definitely wasn't it. That gave us a very clear view of that whatever's going on over there between them they're caught up in 
exactly what we were all broomed into, honestly, which is us getting more and more of a platform and, you know, attention on the backs of others. And what Dan Schneider was saying in that 19 minute whatever is kind of the same thing. Right. He's like, well, I would change things if I could go back and I wouldn't be that mean. But you made all of this money platforms yourself on the backs of other people, not only on the backs of other people, but also people you um, A-B-U-S-E-D. And mistreated. We, we have some incoming news. And that's what needs to change. Can I still be a fan of Nick animation? I mean, depends on the animation. I think Nickelodeon needs, uh, there needs to be a lot more accountability. Nickelodeon's front entrance should have a sorry we're open, um, sorry we're open sign on it. That's sorry that we're open. Oh yeah, here it is. So sorry to Dre gutted I hurt you. Didn't look gutted when you were laughing up a storm, Devin. You've been like this forever too. By the way, come on. Now it's online and now we're like have social media. I was being an idiot today. No way around it. I feel horrible that my dumb ass was even speaking about this without seeing it. See that? See, that's the same type of energy when it comes to those that wrote letters defending Brian Peck. Remember Will and Ryder? How they said, if I knew the details. You see how that, what that energy is and what it implies and how it can be deemed as manipulative? Because it is. You don't need to know all the details about someone's child's essay. Just knowing that somebody did what they did to a kid is enough, right? You don't need to know all the details to know where you stand. You need to know details to be a good human being. No, you don't. Face value, what, what you're being told should have been enough. With Devin Werkheiser, it's the same type of energy, which is now he's saying he just watched it tonight. Dude, there's been articles upon articles about Drake Bell and his ABUSE from, from Brian Peck prior to even the episode, and that's, that's how you chose to behave. And also you're making money off the TikTok thing, talking about Dan Schneider. Like, the whole thing to me didn't feel right or didn't sit right with me, um, but I don't, I don't appreciate that sentence you said. Is that, oh, you watch it tonight. Oh, if you would have watched it before. Bullshit, that's just... I'm over it. I'm so tired of everyone like this, you know? You just get... More and more gray hairs, I guess. Okay, wait, let's finish the let's finish the same in. So quiet on set tonight. I'm horrified by the gravity of what Drake and others shared. Truly heartbroken about what my fellow actors went through. I can't believe they weren't protected. I'm sorry for compounding any hurt. Yeah, Devin, but you also on your show, you know, uh called me crazy, said I was unhinged, didn't even talk about like anything accurately. You were talking about a very specific event that we won't name. And, you know, you misrepresented that. And this be, I really hope you change. And I hope one day you do um, reach out to the people that you actually affected personally. And not everything is for show. I really hope that for you. It feels better. It is better. And you actually can end up being redeemable. You know, but this is not redeemable. This was just Lindsay. Also, her face, like you got, looks looks so angry and just. What is this? Why do we? Why? Why hey, like it's this? Boogie. I played. Like why? This this isn't how it should be. We should all just stand up for one another. We don't have to be friends, but we should wish every one of us that has survived the industry one way or another. Um the best so you know that's how i feel about it so we did it we we dived into dan we dived into devin which is so weird them together all in one day and the protest i'm gonna sleep a long sleep tonight rest hang out with my kids um and i just want to say thanks to everybody who uh virtually protested please share the protest you know share it with survivors, allies, friends, boost it. Um, I think it's really important because this is the, gonna be the only way that we actually start creating change is stepping up in our communities. And I think, I believe in us. I really, really do. Bye everyone. 700. 700.